Hey guys, well, normally I would say welcome back, but in this case I think it's been me who's been missing in action. I'm going to try to get back into this. Galaxy season is well underway and, and uh, I haven't even made the switch over to my SCT yet, so a few things I want to talk about. Some unfinished business that I want to go over and a few techniques and things that I'm doing lately, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the conversion of my imaging rig or the transfer of my imaging equipment over to my uh, Celestron SCT and some of the issues that uh, I expect to face with my ill-tempered Celestron focuser. Let's get started. One of the targets that I've been trying to finish up is the Gordon Nebula with my ED-102 700 millimeter telescope. You can just see the faint outline of the Gord. This is about five hours of just oxygen only data. I haven't done anything to it, but at least you can see the shape and it's a good size target for this particular telescope. It fits the field of view quite well, but it does take a bit of uh, imaging time to collect enough oxygen data and I'm not sure if there's any sulfur and probably some HA, but uh, certainly it's going to take some time to collect some data. And I just haven't been able to get enough time on this target because it's very low on the horizon. I'm in the northern hemisphere. This is best viewed from the su southern hemisphere. And plus I have some additional complications with the uh, fighting the meridian, my house, and the neighbor's house. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go over to Stellarium. Okay, so the last time I was out doing imaging, it was around January 16th or 17th. And this is the Gord Nebula right in here. And this cyan outline is the uh, my house, and then it transitions over to the neighbor's house. And this is the chimney, my neighbor's chimney. And then this is the fence li my fence line that goes around uh to the to the uh, to the north here, so we're in, looking to the south. Uh, here's the meridian, the green line. Here's the meridian. You can see what happens here as I just fast forward. At this point, the the gourd just becomes visible from my house, blocking the view to it. So it's really no point in trying to collect data during this brief period when it's on that side of the meridian. Now, once it switches to this side of the meridian, I can pick it up and follow it on around. But the next thing that's going to happen is, after about an hour or so of collecting data, it's going to bump into the neighbor's chimney. And when that happens, this is what I get for an image. Once the guide star is hidden by the chimney, you can see these three big stars here, 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 and here. Once I it go, the guide star goes behind the chimney, then uh, PhD2 goes into search mode. And of course, I lose a good bit of data uh, an imaging time during this period until the nebula reappears on the other side of the chimney. So during this period, I go off and image another target, do an autofocus one, and then come back to it about here and pick up the target, uh, the Gord Nebula, as it approaches the horizon. This, for where I am in the northern hemisphere, this target never gets above 30 degrees altitude, so it's always low on the horizon. And once it gets down near the fence line, I have to switch and go back to a different target. So this is one of the big challenges I have with the uh, the Gord Nebula. And so what I have to do is to create a fairly uh, complex imaging sequence where I image a target up until the time when the Gord Nebula appears on this side of the meridian. And then when the Gord Nebula reaches the chimney, I go off and image another target for about 30 minutes or so, and then come back to the Gordon Nebula and pick it back up uh, until it gets down too low on the horizon, and then go back up to another target and image that for a while, and then possibly to another target. It's a very complicated imaging plan that I have to create within Nina, so that's one of the big challenges I have with the Gordon Nebula. But I haven't managed to collect enough data on this target yet, so I just have about five hours of oxygen data only, and so I'm going to have to revisit this target again this year. It's just gone by now, so I can't even see it anymore in any, uh, any sense, and even under the best of nights, I only have about three hours of imaging time, and some of that time is, is time spent on the the other side of the uh, meridian where there's just no point in in uh, trying to collect data there. The second target is the jellyfish nebula. This is also taken the same time and this is not a finished image by any means. I've just taken uh, what limited data I currently have on it and combined it, combined the channels to create a sort of color image here, but I haven't done any work on it. The big challenge I have with this target and some other targets where there's a bright star in the field of view is I get quite a bit of haloing here. And you can see the, the outline of the halo here. Let me show you what I've done in Pix Insight to try to reduce this halo effect. Even though this is not the best solution, it's kind of a makeshift solution for now. So here's the HA data from the Jellyfish Nebula, and you can see the halo is appearing here. What I do is go into my dynamic background extraction 
and set up a number of points here to capture the background as you can see but I just pepper this zone here where the halo is with a lot of points just to uh, give this region of the image uh, significantly more weight so that the algorithm won't ignore it. So let's go ahead and execute the dynamic background extraction and see what it comes up with. All right, so here is the background. And if we look at this, we can see that it is pulling out quite a bit of that uh, halo that's, that's uh, managed to find its way into this image. So that's good. But we can also see that if we come back to image background removed, including a portion of the halo, you can see that the halo that appears here is still present, but it's significantly reduced using the dynamic background extraction routine. And if I do the same thing with my sulfur data, in this case, I've still got the same halo. I can call up the dynamic background extraction. Once again, I've got the same data points here. And let's go over here and look at the background and see what it did to the halo. And once again, you can see we pulled out a bit of that halo that's uh, in the sulfur data as well and comparing the two images with and without the dynamic background extraction you can see that it did a pretty good job again still not complete or still a better job to be done now what's kind of unusual about this image is this target i usually get the halo with my oxygen filter more than the sulfur and the uh, hydrogen alpha here it's kind of reversed i'm not getting as much of a background with my oxygen filter as i am with the sulfur and the hydrogen alpha but again, I can apply the same set of points to this particular image. I'm going to increase this to 1.5 on my tolerance. And let's see if that does it. We'll resize all. And now you can see those red turned into cyan, red samples turned into cyan samples. And now I'll go ahead. We can move this guy off to the side and look at the background to see if it pulled out anything. And there's a little bit of a bright spot here. So it did pull out something from the uh, the halo around that star and here you really there was no hint not much of a hint of that halo there in the oxygen channel but here it's even less so this this is something you can do to get rid of the halo during the dynamic background extraction phase but i also want to develop a special purpose uh, astro pi based method of pulling out the halo from images that's something i want to explore in the future now that i'm getting a little more uh, experience dealing with Python. But once again, I've been having to split time between the Gordon Nebula and the Jellyfish Nebula during the uh, end of, of the Nebula season, and so I'm going to have to come back to this target as well in 2021 to finish collecting data. Okay, let's go over to the ED-102. Let me show you something I was doing this past imaging session to improve the deck balance, and then a couple of things that I've done to my SCT uh, imaging rig just to make it a little more functional. Okay, so here's the Explore Scientific ED-102. This is the rig I'm using to capture the Gourd Nebula and the Jellyfish Nebula. I've been doing something different recently to try to do a better job with deck balance. In my case, when I have the telescope mounted in its home position, it will tend to rotate off to the uh, to the left because of the mount has a bit of, of asymmetry to it in terms of mass. But also now when you throw in the filter wheel and its offset mass down there, the guide scope, the uh, potential offset mass of the ultimate power box up here, what I've done is to use this uh, quarter 20 all thread mounted and attached to a couple of angle brackets to the Celestron plate. And then I have a couple of these small rig masses that are threaded on the on one side with a quarter 20 threaded hole. And on the other side, they have a stud like you can see here. And you can just attach these masses one after the other if you need to. So what I've done, and I found this to be very effective with this telescope, is if I set the mass offset like this, then I can have a deck balance regardless of the RA angle. And this worked actually very well. So I'm going to keep forward, go forward with that with my Celestron uh, SCT and with the other refractors when I get back to them. In order to switch over for, to Galaxy Season, I need to take my ultimate power box and at least one of these perforated plates along with 
possibly the masses of the, all the, the offset masses here and transfer those over to my SCT. Now, the SCT is still configured the way it was when I imaged Mars during opposition. There's the Celestron focuser, as you can see. It's mounted to this plate and the, the screws that mount the plate to the SCT itself are hidden underneath the focuser. So that's a potential issue that I've been having uh, some problems with. I have taken off the top rail normally used for a guide scope and the bottom orange original Celestron rail uh, that uh, mates up with the mount. And I've replaced it with this Los Mandy D style plate. It's very sturdy, very expensive, uh, but it allows me to put in, has a number of perforated holes here that I can put a screw into and for example, mount the uh, these angle brackets, one on each side in order to put in a threaded rod as I have done here for the tractor. Another thing that I have done by taking off the rail on the top and the handle, I have gone to these lifting straps as a more hopefully secure way of carrying the SCT out without overstressing two little screws on the top of the SCT body. Now what I intend to do is to possibly use a couple of these angle brackets attached like this and then I can screw them in to the side here and then that can provide a little shelf that I can then attach these um, one of these plates to and have my ultimate power box hanging off to the side. Now when I do that I'm almost certainly going to have to have an offset mass to, uh, to balance the SCT in declination. But I think if I do these things with this plate here I'll have plenty of extra holes uh, to mount the uh, whatever accessories I want to attach to it and it should be I should be in pretty good shape for galaxy season all I have to worry about is that guy well here are these small rig masses that I'm using these offset masses I'm using to improve the balance on the deck axis for my refractors. I'm also going to try this out with the SCT. I bought a few more of these. Now you can get these off of uh, Amazon. They come in several different sizes. The large one here is a 200 gram uh, version and it's about $15 a piece. So they're not cheap but uh, almost nothing in this hobby is. They are handy though in that they have a quarter 20 thread on this end, threaded hole on this end, and a quarter 20 threaded stud on the other end so the masses can be attached to each other and of course as you've seen in the uh, little demonstration there we have a, a threaded rod all thread that's a quarter 20 that this thing can screw onto the end. I also went and purchased a uh, the Los Mandy plate here this is it it's $115 it's not cheap by any means uh, these p pieces here are curved based on the SCT you buy so if you buy this plate uh, you will have the attachment hardware to attach this to the other side of the plate at each end and you will have attachment hardware that will match the thread size in your SCT so you don't have to buy any extra screws or anything these things will mount up just fine you'll just have to make sure you get the right plate for your particular SCT so this curvature works with the body of the SCT. The second problem I have with the SCT of course is the focuser and if you've seen my other videos you know that I've been having issues with uh, one of these screws in particular because of a, essentially damaged threads and the SCT part that they thread into but as the focuser moves back and forth it tends to work these screws loose and I have bought longer screws and I have used Loctite and it didn't come loose during the last imaging session with my SCT but then I was being very uh, judicious in how I used the focuser. I was not using Nina at the time. Nina will exercise the focuser and the autofocus routine much more uh, than I was doing by hand using APT. So I'm expecting to have some problems with this focuser and one of the problems I have, these two screws here attach the body of the, the focus motor to a pair of these outer perimeter screw holes here, threaded holes here. And so that's how the focus motor attaches to this orange part. The orange part is attached in turn to the SCT through the three threaded holes that are in your focuser. What I've had to do is replace these screws with longer screws and I put Loctite in. I don't know if it's going to hold up under the auto focusing routine that Nina goes through. It's quite a bit of focus movement. I'm not expecting good results from that. The focus motor works fine. It's just that there's no way to check 
the tightness of these uh, screws before you go out because the focus motor is concealing them. It's also too much trouble to remove the focuser before each night's of imaging because you've got to take it off. You've got to take off these two screws. There are two set screws that connect the uh, motor shaft to the focuser shaft on the SCT side. So it's really a bit of a hassle to undo all four of those screws in order to just check whether or not you have a loose screw back in here. So that's the aspect of the design that I don't like. There are a couple of focus motors on the market now that uh, that may offer a solution to that. One is the Pegasus Astro. In this case, I'm showing the uh, Focus Cube Zero. It's a new focus motor from uh, Pegasus Astro that apparently has zero backlash, which is nice. Uh, it's not a must-have because there are effective ways of taking care of the backlash. What you can see here is that this focus motor uses a belt drive. So the motor's offset, which is kind of nice because it gets it out of the way. It is making use of the same three screw holes. They do give you longer screws. You'll keep the original part here. Uh, the original orange part and these screws will simply go through that what they call the margarita plate to line up with the screw holes in that that I was just showing you with the SCT. Now in this case this appears to be a different design than my version of the SCT so these screws are are farther out. I suspect with the with my version the C925 these screws are going to be further in and I don't know if I'm going to have access to these screws uh, once this outer pulley assembly is attached. The second thing, even though I'm a big fan of Pegasus Astro hardware, I've got several of their product and it's good stuff. In this particular case, I don't know that I'm that sold on this particular piece of hardware for the SCT, in part because I'm not sure I'm going to have access to these screws. The second thing is you've got to tension this belt, which means you take this bracket, it's bolted in, screwed into the SCT holes here, and you pull the uh, focus body focus her body out in order to tension this uh, belt and then you tighten the screws that attach the body to this bracket well when you tension it you're also putting some side load on these screws and i'm already scared enough with overloading these screws as it is and i don't know that i'm that pleased with a putting side load in addition to what you get from operating the focus motor so I'm not sure that this is the best option. It's also fairly expensive, and with the Focus Cube Zero, you're going to have to get a, fo a motor controller to operate it. Now, in my case, I've got the Ultimate Power Box version 2, which has a motor controller built in that would work with this, so I wouldn't have to buy an extra piece of hardware. But for those of you who want the Zero Backlash option and you don't have a motor controller, you're going to have to get another motor controller that will add on some cost to this already fairly expensive $360 uh, focus cube. There is another option available. CWO offers the 5 volt, the electronic automatic focuser, and in this case the power is supplied through the USB 2 port, and then there's a separate port for uh, the temperature sensor. So another thing I like about the uh, EAF, the ZWO offering here, is that here are the three screws that you attach to. It's making use of the original orange plate that you had with your SCT. It gives you longer screws to span the distance through their plate and through the Celestron plate. For the most part, these screws look completely accessible. It's quite likely that you can uh, check the uh, tightness of these screws each night before you go out. There are two decent options out there that are fairly new that may provide better performance and better uh, reliability than the Celestron focus motor just because you have access to those screws that attach the focuser to the SCT. Here's my no confidence vote in the Celestron focuser attachment. I already have the parts uh, entered in uh, into my uh, basket and I just haven't quite pressed the button yet. Should I order this EAF or not? Okay guys, well I just wanted to check in with you and let you know that I was still around just looking for a little more free time to do some of this fun astrophotography stuff and hopefully I can turn out videos a little more frequently. Who knows? Talk to you guys later.